welcome back to Lookout. Got something different for you today. Uh, got to go out in the field yesterday and check out the Dixie fire. Um, doing some fire science work on a separate project. And so I um, needed to go out and look at the effects of the fire and uh, the fire behavior. So I'm just going to, um, we put together a couple of our videos from the field. And uh, looking at how the fire burned in different kinds of forests and uh, talking a little bit about what caused that. So I'm um, going to just give you kind of a quick preview of that. And uh, real quick, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the terms we're talking about here. And we're going to be talking about fire severity. Uh, severity is basically the effects the fire had on the vegetation. We also talk about the soil burn severity. That's the effects the fire has on the soil itself. But today we're mainly talking about the severity's effect on trees and the vegetation. Jump around a little. This is uh, what we call mixed severity. This is where we've got, um, you know, a good portion of the trees survive. There's some low severity in here as well. Uh, this is also mixed severity. There's a, a really wide variety of types of burns within the Dixie fire. Uh, we tried to sample all of it yesterday. So I'm just giving you some kind of overview. This is also mixed severity. This is in an area where the fire didn't race kind of head first through the fire, but or through this forest, but it kind of spread in from the side after the main fire had passed. This is what uh, we call high severity, uh, black sticks. And this area, the fire, it took the full force of the fire's main run. This is the main run that also kind of um, went through to the west of Chester on the biggest day of spread. Um, Long Highway 36. Um, this was also fairly high severity. Even though there's a lot of foliage on a lot of these trees, a lot of them are likely going to die. More high severity. Um, this is up on the southern edge of Lassen Park. Um, this area actually had very low severity. Uh, the fire backed down after several days. Um, this area, same area, also um, has some really huge kind of old growth sugar pine. Um, and as you can see on these trees, you know, the first branches aren't for sometimes 50 feet. Thick bark, not a lot of fuel on the ground. So these old growth forests, um, this is one reason we didn't have a lot of high severity fire in a lot of our old growth forests is just that these trees were naturally resistant to fire. Um, some of these areas that burn in the meadows are already re-sprouting. Um, saw a lot of wildlife, a lot of deer out. Um, these sprouts are really, you know, fresh food for deer and other critters. Uh, mixed severity fire here where the fire backed down into the meadow. More mixed severity. Here's some low to moderate severity. Uh, this is an area that the fire also didn't really run through head first, but kind of back slowly through. Up by Hat Creek Rim today, um, or yesterday, we saw a lot of um, high severity in areas that were very flat and open and well thinned, uh, which is kind of a testament to the severe weather that was happening when the fire moved through there. Um, here's some what we call backing fire. You know, so the fires just kind of come down the hill here without the wind on it. This was yesterday after some rain. Um, this is fire. The flames here is actually it's actually burning in a scar from an old fire, and you can also see. Um, on the screen here above my head. Um, this is a fire scar too. So uh, there's signs all over the landscape of how frequently we, we used to have fire. This is the Reading Fire in Lassen Park. We've been talking a lot about that on the lookout. Um, this area burned in 2012 and the fire took quite a long time to get through this burn just because there was a lot of green brush that wasn't very flammable. And even though there was a lot of sticks and large material on the ground, that's a lot of stuff that's kind of been packed down under snow for you know, almost a decade. So the fire burned slowly through here. So you can see that there's actually some small green trees in this burn that survived and will be, you know, the future forest. This is in Lassen Park looking um, out towards the center of the park. And we see, you know, um, statistics about, you know, how over 50% of the park is burned. And I think we, we rushed to judge that that is um, a bad thing. But the park has had a lot of fire even in recent times. And you can see here that probably at least half the trees in this area are gonna survive. Here we're looking down towards Harkness and Drake's Bad. You can see that there were some high severity patches on these mountains uh, where the fire ran with the slope and the winds up the mountains. Some of these areas have also had high severity fire in the past, which is why they burn hot again. There's brush there and small trees from fires or dense thickets of trees that are the same age because it all burned say 100 years ago. Another view here looking north towards, kind of towards Juniper Lake. There's a patch of high severity fire in the middle. And then in the foreground, we see low and moderate severity fire. This is looking down towards Kelly Mountain and uh, Terminal Geyser. Uh, also, that kind of mixed severity. 
So that's just kind of to give us the recap. Um, we're going to go into some video now. Um, we're going to talk a bit about um, how fire burn in some areas have been really intensively managed. So this surprises me. This is heavily thin forest. You know, this is a fuel break along a road. This is what we thought for years would help us control fires at the landscape scale. And it just, you know, there's huge spacing. You know, these trees are like 30 feet apart and they're all totally cooked. Like what happened here? If you look at this tree over here, they probably can't see in this picture, but the needles are all frozen pointing in a single direction. So we'll look at that. That That's some a clue at what happened here. So it's a little hard to see here, but the way these pine needles are frozen, we call that needle freeze. And what happens basically is as the fire's burning, it just, it burned through here so hot and fast that it froze the vegetation in a direction it was pointing. So this is needle freeze here. Tells us that the wind was blowing really hard that way. So I'm facing into the wind here. I can feel the wind on my face. And it's about the same time of day as when the fire blew through here. So, you know, one of the reasons that this area burned so hot is we're right on top of a, a natural little drainage here that funnels these terrain winds. And so that, um, in this kind of thick forest here along this drainage, you know, a lot of the heat that built up out of that um, was probably part of what came into this thinned area and killed it. But it just points out that there's spots on the landscape that are naturally prone to more severe fire along drainages, especially along drainages that align with our prevailing winds that we have during fire season. So those are some things that we can use to decide like, hey, maybe we shouldn't try to have a tree farm right here, or maybe we shouldn't build a mobile home park right here. You know, there's a lot we know about how fire moves on the landscape that can inform us making better decisions. You know, if you think of a floodplain um, and not building, you know, a bank or something of that you want to be along, around for a long time in the floodplain, we've also got kind of a fire plain um, where a fire will flood across the land. And so just understanding some of those basic ideas of how fire moves on the land can help us make better decisions about what we do, where we put things on the land, especially things of value that we don't wanna have be destroyed. Well-spaced, big, larger trees. There was a lot of small kind of Christmas trees in here. And all the big trees are dead. So another look at that area we're just looking at um, with the kind of the dense little Christmas trees and everything dead. And then um, we come around the corner here and this area was thinned in the last 20 years and so we don't have really any of the little baby Christmas trees. The same wide spacing on all the big trees and uh, most of them are dead too. We're kind of in a topographic kind of funnel here, um, a bit of a, a notch in this mountain. And like we were talking about before, things like that really, um, they can give you the potential for um, a lot more severe fire behavior. So here, uh, winds coming from the north kind of were squeezing through this notch. Uh, when you get out of that notch a little, when we look over here, there's some of these trees did survive. But it's still striking to see these large, well-spaced trees without a bunch of understory vegetation that still all died. So here we're in the same section of the forest as the last two segments of video, but now we're um, in a spot on the landscape that isn't in a draw and a little more um, maybe sheltered from the way the wind was blowing and a lot of the trees survived in here. So just kind of going to show kind of how fickle fire effects can be. This area has also been thinned really heavily in the past 20 or 30 years. All right, so we're in an area here um, up by the Hat Creek Rim, and this um, pretty open stand, open stand of timber here that 
Um, it's been thinned and the fire blew through here last night and it looks like all the big trees and even a lot of the smaller trees have survived. Um, farther back down the road here we've seen a lot more mortality back towards Hack Creek Rim but this is uh, kind of textbook underburn. Um, if anything you'd want it even a little hotter to kill some of these uh, baby pine trees here to keep them from becoming the thicket of the future. But um, nice example here, what we talk about when we talk about low severity or good fire. So thanks for watching the lookout. Uh, you know, as we move out of active fire season, we're, we're focusing more and more on the fire ecology, uh, the fire behavior, and just kind of um, our aim with this is to help everyone kind of have a better fluency in fire. So we can stop talking purely about fire in negative terms and positive terms. You know, um, we know that so many people we know have been affected really severely by this fire, whether it's through evacuations and being gone from home for weeks and weeks or losing your home or losing your community. And uh, this discussion of good fire, it's not at all intended to um, minimize the pain and suffering this fire has caused. But it's also just to point out that um, these things are complicated. Um, there is such thing as good fire and that the more good fire that we can put on our landscapes, um, the safer our communities will be. Um, hope you all learned something from this and keep watching and supporting the lookout to get more of this kind of information.